Well, good morning. This is an amazing conference. I'm absolutely astounded at the amount of information we've seen so far in this show. Everything from Juno to Juju and all the rest of the alphabet letters as well. Uh, the vendor exhibits, the information that we are gathering as consumers or as developers on this product is just absolutely amazing. In fact, it is so good, I want to leave. And you see, cloud is not just a new buzzword. OpenStack is not just the new cloud OS, but it's opening up a whole new cloud paradigm for each and every one of us that's attracting thousands of users, thousands of developers, analysts, and everybody from enterprises through to startups is trying to figure out how do I harness the power of this cloud? And so why do I want to leave? Because I believe that the only way we can truly leverage what OpenStax brings to the table is to move our application portfolios to cloud, to OpenStack. And that's why we've got work to do. Especially over the last five years, uh, I have worked with many different teams, uh, software development teams, operations teams, business marketing, sales teams, and I've seen a common pattern that's emerged across those interactions. And it's about that pattern that I'm gonna speak in this session today. And so I wanna set the stage clear in the beginning. Uh, this is not a session full of thousands of details, but it's a session about providing you a framework, a taxonomy if you wanna call that, that as you move through the same process in your world, you can collect information. And the idea is, is that you start with an existing portfolio, and when you are done, you're starting, you will end up with a cloud-optimized portfolio. Let's look at the business reality. Not all applications are born multi-tenant. Agile, delivered in one-week sprints through test-driven software development, through CI, CD, and pair programmers on an elastic multi-tenant cloud, right? Unfortunately, I think it, it was nice to think that is the way everything starts, but the reality is quite the opposite. The reality is as much of our portfolio, our collective enterprise portfolio is still waterfall. It is still thick clients, and it's old code. And so cloud always, and OpenStack comes up and it says, what do I do now? On the other end, if we look at our resources, our resources is good at 12 months sprints, right? They are so deeply embedded in their code, they have hundreds of years of collective knowledge, and they use IP to protect job security, are hesitant in taking risks, and they don't want to change the status quo. But our customers and our CEO is asking us, what are we doing about this cloud? How are we gonna use it for our organization? The wheel has turned, and there is no going back. So as we go into the cloud model, knowing the business reality, I've had many conversations early al along in the, in the cloud uh, path that says, well, you should just go agile, right? And then I had a couple of frowns, th stares there at me and says, no, no, we, we don't do agile, we do waterfall. But I've heard all of these good things about cloud and it's so easy to spin up VMs and I can destroy it and I don't have the restrictions of what I face today. Uh, but I can't just go cloud agile. And so in those interrogations, we've realized that there should be a first step, and that step we started calling cloud friendly. Contrasting to an on-premise product or a legacy product, this first band in the model is about cloud friendliness. It's not specifically where you're gonna make money if you're a vendor. It's not specifically where you will have ecstatic enterprise users, but it's an entrance point into the cloud. From cloud friendly, you move into a cloud ready. And now in cloud readiness, you're starting to harness more of the power of cloud. And from cloud ready, we eventually end up with a cloud optimized model. Quite interesting as well, is that as I had those discussions with various teams, those teams seems to fit into three general groups. And so the first group is the business domain. And we'll deep dive into who those people are, but it's typically, the product marketers, the relationships managers in the enterprise, 
those guys that's pitching cloud, but they don't have a cloud portfolio in front of them yet. It is our general counter, counsel. It's the lawyers that's got to set up the contract. It's the service management teams that's got to set up an SLA with the consumer of this cloud product. They don't know specifically how to write code or how to operate it, but they often take the tip of the spear for us. And so this domain of people came out in the model. The second domain, I think, is the one that most of us is quite familiar with. It's our software development teams. And so keep in mind, from a legacy perspective, we've got Waterfall moving in many enterprises to Agile. In many, I've seen different teams. One team takes Waterfall products, while another team comes up along their side and start building Agile. And so you see both, but quite often it's with an intention to move into a modern Agile world. And so the software development is what I call the technology domain. And then lastly, we're looking at the operating model or the operating domain. And there's two specific groups that I classify in, inside of this domain. One is the operations team. And we'll talk in this uh, session about operations, moving to hosted operations, moving to DevOps. And the second one is our security teams. Very important to understand that once we move into the cloud paradigm, that security eventually is not an afterthought. As quickly as possible, it becomes part of the development cycle. So, going through many different products, um, and I'll give some product examples without naming the guilty parties uh, as we go through this process. Um, an engagement typically for me would start with an architectural review. And I would like to love, love to look at the software and how's the software constructed, where does the software come from, from a technology perspective. So I would look at an architecture review and I would ask the developer or the operator or the person that knows most about this product, so it's described your product to me in three tiers. What is the front end component? What is located on the desktop? What is the web? Is there a web interface? And I would kind of from there look into the middle tier components. So it's what does the application integration look like? Do you use queuing or not? Do you have proprietary protocols? Will it, can it function across a multi-tier uh, network? And then I look at the data model. How do you store content? Very seldom do I find a monolithic system that is multi-tenant by design. Again, that's our end state. And so with that as information, a basic understanding of the application, I would go sit down with the sales guy. And so one of the first things I've realized is that companies or internal providers often start selling cloud before they've got a licensed contract. And I can't tell you the number of times that I've sat in front of a client deep into the sales cycle when they look at the contract that's placed in front of them and they say, Skulk, you have told me that you are providing me a full cloud system equivalent to everybody else in the world. But when I look at your contract, it's talking about licensed software. And that's from a non-technologist. So you should take your old license contract, you should take your old service agreements inside of the enterprise, and you should start introducing cloud terminology inside of it. For instance, you cannot commit to staying in one data center. On-premise did not have that concept. You sell the software or you deliver the service, and that consumer, again, within the enterprise or from a vendor perspective outside, they had full control about where it's going to be installed. But in a cloud contract, you cannot limit yourself to that. So you should start introducing terminology that says, I, as a service provider, again, inside or outside, has the ability legally to move your data wherever it is. And now you could become very specific. You could say as well, I will involve my customer from a change control process. I will guarantee that it will be within country borders. So you could become very specific there. But you take one customer, you start with your existing contract, and you start changing that uh, language. You should have a basic SLA. Many people come to me and say as well, we want to go cloud, and I would love to have 99.999% availability. And I said, well, come back once you've uh, got a different perspective. <laughs> because in an on-premise environment, there is often expectation that the system will never go down. The reality is far from that. If we look at systems across the enterprise, often inside of our network, we've got much lower availability. But the re reality is, is we don't measure that. So as a cloud provider or as 
a, a company using cloud uh, operating systems, you should set a target of 99.5%. And with that 99.5% in your contracts, there will be certain penalties. Licensed software does not have those penalties. So you should start thinking now is how do I commit to that SLA? And then also afterwards, how do I measure it? Because from time to time, there will be a penalty that will be leveraged against the provider. There should be a basic services agreement. On-premise software again, or inside of the network uh, software, has got a different style of services. We go through more of a life cycle of developing software than supporting it as a cloud provider. So look at your services contracts, and in specific, in those services contracts, you need to touch on the roles and responsibilities. What is your responsibility to provide as the provider, and what is the responsibility of the consumer? At the end of the day, a cloud system will only be successful if you retain your customers. Too many of our enterprise customers bypass IT because not only are they frustrated, but they are competing against an industry who makes its money in retaining customers. So don't just think software, but start thinking about a service model with a focus of retaining your customers. All right, as we move from uh, the, the, the business domain into the technology domain, in this cloud-friendly band, uh, we quite, quite often find FAT uh, clients. So a FAT client is defined as software running on a desktop, connecting to some kind of a, desk, a back end. Two very common characteristics immediately comes out. Number one, that FAT client has got unlimited bandwidth. There's no concept of internet. Number two, Quite often you will find that the fat client downloads huge amounts of information, proprietary content, PII information to the desktop, and runs some SQL statements on the desktop, and then sends it back all without it being encrypted. So those are the two common things that you've got to look at. Now, unfortunately, these fat clients have been developed over the last 25 years, or five, or 10, you, you take your pick. And so it's not easy to take that flat client and build it over into a thin web client. But in today's world of business intelligence, as you can sit down and you can say is, what is the most common characteristics that hits 80% of my user base that I need to build into a web client? And so that will cover maybe 80% of your users, but you retain the flat client in some way or shape, maybe through a VPN connection to the service provider, for the power user or for the administrative user. And so your development team start now thinking in web interfaces and APIs where previously they only had a fat client available. Uh, it, again, quite common to see a monolithic application. When you speak to the development team or the ops guy, you ask him, how many servers does it take to install your application? And the answer comes back and says, well, we can do it all on one. And when you start diving into the architecture, you realize, whoops, there's a proprietary protocol between the fat client and the back end that needs this application to function. And so by just asking this concept and introducing this concept, concept that you've got a network, and through an IP protocol, you need to communicate to a second network, the team starts thinking about that from a roadmap perspective. Says, what is the challenges at pulling my application apart? And pulling the application apart into a front end, an application, and a database model is extremely important in this cloud world. Because not only do you want to secure the front end, you also want to become increasingly more secure in the middle and at the back end as you store data. You will need all of those things to convince your customer that you are good enough to, do, to earn their business. Security scanning, uh, very often in legacy applications, is optional. Uh, but in any one of our big enterprises, we've got really good security teams. And those security teams will find a new world in the OpenStack domain, in the cloud development model, that says developers are eager to work with them. I am working with some teams that within five minutes from a security scan being done, they will have the code written for the vulnerabilities shown. And that is security on steroids, but you've got to inject it. At a, at a place. You've got to show a team what is the exposure on their application. At the operating domain, you need to think of data center, cloud platform, 
an application. Let's look at those certifications. certifications. At a data center level, we come out of a SAS 70, and we still, still have data centers that are only professing, I am SAS 70, 70 certified. What does that mean? It means that that data center has got a certain amount of controls that guarantee how they operate. That model of SAS 70 is moving to SSIE 16. And so we have a lot more fun in an SA 16 audit versus SAS 70. Uh, it's much more broader, it's much more applicable to the customer. But as you advertise your product, you need to ask the question that says, is my data center SAS 70 certified or is it SSIE 16? And that's a beginning point because you can't go to the market, you can't go to your customer unless you have a certain guarantee of compliance. And secondly, the teams working with the product is quite often traditional operations, people that's extremely dependable, they are predictable, they are process driven, and they are slow by design. And as we move into the cloud paradigm, that traditional operations team needs to adopt the model of moving to a hosted operations team. And we'll get to DevOps in a bit. But hosted operations mean is they don't support just one set of servers. There's not very much a zoning in onto specific products, but it's a general tool set supporting multiple applications or multiple clients. And so this hosted operations team starting to put the client first and the system second. And that's a characteristic when we look at the cloud is the customer comes first. You retain the customer, you make money. You retain the customer, you retain your job inside of the enterprise. But if you don't, you move on. Right, so let's look at the maturity as we grow now. And so this first band often materializes in the roadmap, roadmap, roadmap activities. Sometimes it will take six months, sometimes it will take a year. And you can only move as fast as what your organizational capabilities are. I've seen two different models in how people speed it up. One is looking at the talent inside of your organization that wants to tackle these new products. It's somebody that's hired with an agile ability, maybe have not operated in it, but that person will jump in and start developing or start coding for these new practices. The second one is hire somebody with this kind of experience. Having a good hire on your team that understand Agile, that understand Cloud, that understand multi-tenant is a quick boost of lifting uh, your uh, product into this realm. Cloud ready at the business domain is now looking at a standardized cloud contract, but for one customer across all products. So we, we quite often have business units and every business unit may have 10 or 20 applications. Think at this level of creating a business unit agreement that can cover all of those applications. Don't think of everything for everybody at this point in time, but start grouping where it makes sense. SLAs still stay at 99.5%, but offer additional guarantees. Maybe it's 99.9, .9, or maybe it's selling DR or uh, an additional service to get from 99.5 to a better agreement. Most customers will say 99.5 is okay for non-critical applications, but I want more for critical. So start thinking from a sales perspective, from a product marketing perspective, how do I add specific services, but as a paid engagement, very real. Uh, and then at a, at a service agreement from a common service, offer different bands of services, for instance, a platinum, platinum level service agreement. Now the customer comes to you, you've got a product that's not just on-premise anymore, it runs in a cloud model very slowly, but those customers are often the one that you need. You've got the relationship and they're willing to invest in you at becoming cloud optimized, but they want something special, so you're gonna set up something special for them. In the technology domain, uh, absolutely start thinking now about multiple clients, web, and device specific connecting through a common API. Having the common API layer is one of the first things to achieve in the technology domain. Because that common API uh, layer will also be the one in a cloud optimized platform that will be your first task at elasticity, scaling on demand. But it cannot do it if it's proprietary protocols. Think definitely at a three tier architecture, not just two tier at this point in time. And everything should be encrypted. Communications to the backend should be encrypted, and communications at the backend should be encrypted. But 
you may say, I will store data encrypted at rest or content, but maybe my database is not encrypted at this point in time. Those are things you've got control over. Or you maybe say, as I want my database, my search engine, all of my content to be encrypted, and that's great. Just keep in mind it will take a long time to do all of that. So decide at that level of encryption what is important. And now at this level, you start introducing vulnerability scanning. Take the OWASP top 10 and see from the outside what is the vulnerabilities of my system and start thinking, how do you bring that quickly into the development process? Phase one or cloud friendly is knowing where I'm standing. Cloud ready is introducing what I'm knowing inside of my development process. In the operating domain, SSA is 16. SAS 7 is not an option from my perspective in the industry today. SSA 16 is you've got to attest to your capabilities, but then you should also be measured or audited against it. Now you can say as I have an SSA 16 for my hosting center, my data center, and this is where you should start thinking about, I have an SSA 16 for my cloud operating system, for my OpenStack deployment, meaning that my OpenStack guys will also be measured from a security perspective, because at the end of the day, it's a layered cake. You can't just have an SSA 16 at the application, but things underneath it is not healthy. And then from a DevOps perspective, is now we're touching on what is that? And DevOps is a team in a nutshell integrated with agile development, scrum, and sprints. And so now we're looking at cloud ready, you don't find the terminology of waterfall anymore. You only find Agile, you only find Scrum, you only find scrim, Sprints, and you find the ability to put people into those uh, work sessions. All right, and eventually if you get all of that right, you're gonna move into a cloud-optimized uh, model. Standard cloud contracts shared among, amongst all application families. If you can have one in your general counsel, the customers buy one product from you, then they buy a second product, the same thing is true as they want to see the same contract. As a matter of fact, I have found that customers are often lenient at expecting things in a contract that make sense to them. They don't want the whole enchilada. If I work with a lawyer from a customer perspective that puts a 500-page document to me, my first meeting will be as, let's, let me, let's see what you are looking for. There is a perception in cloud is that you're going to consume a server at a lower cost because we've got the benefits of multi-tenancy. That comes at a, a rational behavior at a contract level. So put in that contract what is reasonable to be expected for that customer. Best in breed SLAs, 99.95%, and now we can look at it from a technology perspective that says, how do I use my autonomous zones? How do I use multiple sets of applications? And I can go wild at meeting that 99.5. I can go wild at monitoring it. But basically what I do is, is I'm stating that I've got a best in breed SLA. Now I have not seen many customers or many companies that says best in breed is four nines or five nines. So you're looking at three and a half nines. That's kind of where the industry has said is three and a half nines. I can live with so many minutes of downtime for my service uh, in this cloud model. And then custom services agreement. So uh, the reality is unfortunately unfortunate, like this way is, is you want to standardize as much as possible, but you will have specific customers or specific business groups that is spending enormous amounts of money on your software. And so those cases is you're going to go all out at making sure that your team from a services perspective is integrated with the customer team. And so we come back with the custom model, but it is absolutely revenue driven. At the technology domain, uh, we now have elastic APIs that can scale on demand. We don't just have scalability, but we have multi-dimensional scalability. We can't just scale horizontal, but we want to scale vertical as well. We want to be able to take one customer's workload and move it to a certain set of database servers if my platform of database servers can't handle my collective load. So we're not just looking at elasticity in a, in, a, in a linear manner, we're looking at it in a multi-dimensional model. And we go full out on security. IDS, IDP, firewalls all over the show, security monitoring, all integrated into the development process. You will know it works, and when you see the scanning email come out, 
And 15 minutes later, you see the response come out from the development team that says, this is inside of the next sprint. This is inside of the next release. I've tested it. It will be in production within a week. And at the operating domain, SSIE 16 now on all three levels, at the data center, at the cloud operating system, at OpenStack level, and at the DevOps level. I'm fortunate to work with HP. It was one of the best security teams in, the, in, in, in OpenStack world. Uh, if I look at their SSA 16, their security models in HP Cloud Services, it is just a pleasure to work with them. They take it off my plate. But I can guarantee my customers is not only is our data center secure, but cloud is secure as well as the applications running on that cloud. Okay, so keep in mind again the pattern. The pattern is a framework. It is a maturity model. So the intention of the model is to give you a starting point. It will take you from the starting point into a final end state. But it is a model that you can explain in interactions with your developers, with your sales teams, with your legal, with your marketing teams, with your customers. That makes sense. There's a lot more detail behind this as you go through the process. And uh, again, as you do an architectural review of an application, that's my choice to start with that. I don't typically start with a, a business perspective. In most cases, I've seen the business far ahead of the technology teams. That says, I see this as a, a way to, to compete better with my customer. I see this as a way to make more money. And so the technology teams comes up and says, how do I fulfill this business vision? But doing an architectural review gives you a good context on that application that you can step through this in a roadmap perspective. One of the questions I often get asked is, how long does it take? <laughs> I love one of the, uh, the triangles of us in the keynote, fast, uh, uh, cost, speed. And uh, all we have today is fast, fast, and fast. So that's the answer. Do it fast, fast, and fast. Decide where you want to start, whether it's your people or your technology, but act in urgency. I'm going to dive into two of these domains a little bit deeper. Uh, the first one is going to be in the compliance model. And I've detected a slight change in the compliance model as we move from a SAS 70 model, that's barely sufficient for the application, into especially enterprises that's adopting cloud platforms. And the enterprise, again, has got established security teams. They've got established security policies. And they expect people to follow their guidance because their jobs is to protect us in the enterprise from bad things to happen with us. And so they don't start with an application. They start today with a unified compliance framework. What is a, US, a UCF? A UCF, in a nutshell, is security guys that understand all of the security frameworks. They understand SSAE 16s. They understand HIPAA and FedRAMP and PCI and whatever you want to call it. And so they recognize that there is common controls across all of those frameworks. The clever security team also understands that not all of these controls is applicable to a cloud maturity model of cloud ready. They will expect less at cloud ready because you can't deliver all of it. They will expect more at cloud friendly and they will expect all of it at cloud optimized. But a UCF is a grouping of controls that will feed the compliance frameworks. So if you want to deal with the federal government, you pursue your FedRAMP certification, it's going to be a very specific set of controls. If you are medical insurance and you want to go for EPA, that's what the UCF will provide. So again, it's turned around, not SAS 70, and then application, it's now UCF and all of the frameworks below that. But at least have the following control objectives inside of your application. When we look at hosting that cloud application, whether it's from a, with a partner or inside of our own data centers, uh, be sure it's secure, highly available with global coverage. There's more than enough options in the world. One of the characteristics in the cloud world as well is uh, an application does not stay within country borders. With, before you know it, there's another country, another team that wants to, to consume it. So when you start your planning, choose partners with that kind of coverage. Make sure communications to the applications, data in motion and data at rest. There are a set of controls stating what those needs to be and they are measured. 
A customer wants to know that in a multi-tenant -system, multi system that there is secure account management principles. And so you logically have to explain. I've seen one very good example of one of the products I've worked with is that the web layer is fully multi-tenant, but in an application and database layer, it is fully single tenant. And that application is busy moving into a maturity model of optimized, but today they can't. But at a web layer, they are introducing account management principles. Everybody logs into the same interface, and as you log in, you get zoned into your logical tenant and then into your specific infrastructure in the back end. Data privacy, uh, make sure you sign up and uh, do safe harbor in the international uh, organizations that comes with this. Uh, make sure you have disaster recovery and backups from day one. In my previous model, I explained that DR, uh, specific RPOs and RTOs, could be a sellable service. It takes a customer from bronze to platinum. So you've got to think of how do you pay for DR, meaning you've got to think of how do you charge money for DR. But whether your customers buy it or not, you cannot afford moving into the cloud unless you have DR and backups from day one. It may be a tabletop DR exercise on day one that moves into eventually a warm, eventually a multi-regional model, but have it on day one. And then lastly, security monitoring and management. As you go through the, the, the sales process, as you look through the uh, providing of the service, the auditor of your customer or your internal audit team will ask you for the evidence in each one of these controls. Okay, so let's finish this discussion on the DevOps model. I'm always amazed uh, every conference, every session that I attend on this topic, uh, I would ask the presenter and says, what do you think? Where is DevOps? Is it part of R&D or is it part of operations? And it's quite predictable depending on from where that person comes from. If he comes out of a software development, yep, his answer is very predictable. It's part of the R&D team. And I've seen the operations guys with equal amounts of passion, really intelligent guys on their field, asked in the exactly the same way. He says, yep, it's part of the operations team. So I'm not going to try and solve that problem today, but I'm going to tell you what it looks like when it works. So DevOps is a scrum for operations that is integrated with the development teams. They are engineers with tight feedback loops that are part of daily stand-ups. This is one of the most important things on the DevOps team, is the ability of that person to see immediately when something will go wrong and feed it back into the software development lifecycle. The developers love that kind of talent because they don't have to worry. They know somebody's going to catch it. Even though quality starts at the first test you write, at the first line of code you, you write, you've got that integrated feedback loop. And they are involved with planning activities in iterations alongside the developers. Old school means that I receive my oper operational requirements after the code is written. No, in new school, the operations team is integrated into the planning. They decide what some of these t-shirt sizes are. They work with those developers at making it real. What does DevOps do? They are absolutely masters of application deployment. They own the tools and the procedures to move code through environments. From a security perspective, at some point in time, you need to have segregation, segregation of duties between development environments and production. Your customers will expect that from you. In a smaller shop, the architect will do everything. But as you grow and revenue flows with your product, either inside of the enterprise or outside, security teams will ask, is, who's, who's, what's your check and balance there? They provide and use monitoring tools, again, that generate continuous feedback. And so lastly, let's look at the hiring qualities. It could be a developer with an interest in operations or an operations guy that can code. All right, this is as clear as that. And so you apply it to your specific team or specific circumstances, but it's one of those two teams, one of those two guys. They are adaptable and creative. They do not work against the dev team, but with them. One of the biggest things you can do as you mature in the cloud development 
into deploying OpenStack is to find people that's eager to work with the development teams. There's no more us and them. Break down the boundaries. Break down the walls in the cubes and put the ops guy and the developer in the same cube, maybe get them two different computers. But if you want to stimulate that behavior. Experts in scripting languages. Bash, Perl, Python, bonus in my world is uh, Ruby, Groovy, and Arlong. So you get those kind of skill sets, bring them in. Very strong Linux background. Uh, there is a clear movement from Microsoft Windows as the, the key enterprise operating system into a Linux-based model. And then tools-wise, Nagios, Puppet, and Chef. Okay, so what I've done um, in this presentation, if I sketch the, the reality of our world, we all can, all can be excited about OpenStack. But as we move from reality into current environment, think of this model and document it further inside of your world. Cloud friendly, moving to cloud ready, moving to cloud optimized. Thank you. We are out of time uh, for the session, so I'm not going to open up the floor for questions, but if anybody wants to ask questions afterwards, I'll be on the side.